thank you all for coming to, uh, it's actually, I think AIM uh, 287 is actually the session ID, Introduction to AWS DeepRacer. My name is Mike Miller. I'm a senior manager of the AI devices team uh, at AWS. I've been with Amazon for just over six years. The first uh, bunch of those were actually working at Lab126, which is the consumer devices subsidiary of Amazon. I uh, led product management for the Fire TV and the Fire TV stick devices. Let's hear it for Fire TV. Anybody have one? All right. Yeah, I love my Fire TV stick. Uh, use it every day, all the time. So really proud to have been a part of launching that device. Um, and uh, of the devices that we've been fortunate enough to be able to build uh, and get into developers' hands uh, with AWS. Uh, so again, thank you guys for coming, for spending uh, your evening with me. This is a one-hour session. I'll probably have about 40 minutes or so of content for you, and then we'll open up to questions at the end of the floor. Um, so be thinking of questions. This session in the catalog, I actually thought it was a 200 session, but when I looked again, it was a 300. So, uh, you know, it'll be somewhat high level, uh, but I'm happy to dive into additional details, you know, during Q&A if you all want to. Um, I know reinforcement learning and a lot of the mis machine learning topics can be pretty complicated. So I want to make sure that, you know, we keep things at a level that uh, folks can understand, and then you have a chance to, to go deeper. And I'll definitely give you some resources at the end of the uh, slide deck that um, give you some ways to get involved or to go deeper uh, while you're here at reInvent. So first of all, uh, who saw or listened to uh, Andy's keynote this morning and saw a lot of those launches? Awesome. So yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I was, I was backstage uh, listening, um, and so obviously uh, there were a, a slew of um, ML announcements uh, that Andy made. Of course, one of them was uh, AWS DeepRacer. Um, so I'd, by a show of hands, who here um, has uh, ML experience? like writing code or dealing with ML. So, okay, that's maybe like 10% or 20%. So it's great. So a lot of you are going to be ML novices, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, as you'll see when we get into the deck, uh, the reason we built AWS DeepRacer was really as a way to get everyday developers and data scientists exposed to these great innovations. All right, so let's just get started. Um, I'll kick it off with a little origin story, talk about RL for the Sunday driver, uh, we'll go under the hood, uh, and then we'll talk about the rubber meets the road. And you're probably shaking your head right now, and I have to apologize in advance, because uh, when you ship a device that's a race car, you just have an incredible opportunity to be punny. And so I'm, I'm going to apologize for the next one year's worth of driving puns that you'll hear us and my team make as we talk about uh, Deep Racer. So I apologize for that uh, in advance. All right, so let's get started with the origin story. Um, you know, as part of Andy's keynote, he announced end-to-end -end support for reinforcement learning in Amazon SageMaker. Amazon SageMaker RL with, you know, broad support for managed algorithms, um, integration with some of the most common RL frameworks, Ray RL, uh, Intel Coach, um, simulation environments uh, like MATLAB and Simulink, um, and of course integration with the new robotics service that we just announced called AWS RoboMaker. And if those terms all go over your head, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll go into those uh, as we get into this. Um, but let's just sort of tee up reinforcement learning in the broader kind of context of AI. You know, deep learning and machine learning traditionally um, fell into broad categories based on kind of the amount of training data that you had uh, that you could use to train your models and the sophistication of the deep learning models. So supervised learning, uh, that's uh, the type of learning that uh, occurs when you have a large set of training data that's labeled. So if you think about trying to train a machine learning model to, let's say, identify flowers, uh, the easiest way to do that is to get thousands of pictures of flowers uh, and label them all. Have a human person go, okay, well, this one's a daffodil, that one's a rose, this one's a chrysanthemum, um, and do that over and over and feed all of that data into the machine learning model and train it using data. So that's supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is where uh, you also have a large set of data, but it's not labeled, and you use the algorithm to try to find some hidden structure in this data. So think about like anomaly detection, for instance. 
This third complementary approach really has emerged called reinforcement learning, or we abbreviate it as RL often. Uh, RL takes a different approach, um, and RL actually enables learning complex behaviors without pre-labeled data. And so that's what makes RL uh, really powerful. So let's just use a really simple example to kind of give you a high level understanding of how RL works. So let's think about using an algorithm to play Pac-Man. Luckily, Pac-Man only knows how to go up, down, left, right. So it's a very easy set of actions uh, that Pac-Man can take um, in each sort of state transition. So each state is basically maybe moving one unit up, down, left, or right, or maybe staying still if he's hiding in a corner. That actually makes it pretty easy for the algorithm to play. Also, luckily, within RL, we typically build a simulation and we train an agent inside of a simulation. Well, for us, the game is the simulation. So if we just use the game uh, as the sort of simulation environment, we get uh, an easy way to train it and to run lots of training uh, kind of runs. Finally, we assign rewards for the desired behavior that we want. So in this case, we assign rewards for the more um, pac dots Pac-Man eats or the more points he scores in actuality, right? Because he can score points by eating pac dots He can also score points by uh, eating ghosts after he's eating the power, the power dots. So once we assign that reward function, we kind of define it and associate it to that environment that we're gonna be testing in, we allow the algorithm to play potentially hundreds or thousands of times uh, and instruct it to maximize its rewards. So in this case, maybe it learns to eat fruit while avoiding being eaten by a ghost. So as I mentioned, RL's superpower is learning those complex behaviors without requiring labeled training data. So RL algorithms can make short-term decisions while optimizing for a long-term goal. This makes it really powerful in solving problems that have a complex domain space where there's a lot of uh, opportunity for changes in environments. Uh, some examples uh, where reinforcement learning has been successfully applied include autonomous cars, fleet logistics, financial trading, uh, data center cooling, uh, maybe uh, optimizing supply chain, um, you know, manufacturing, et cetera. So while this technology is really exciting and uh, broadly applicable, it's got a very steep learning curve uh, and the the level of technology and sort of systems that you have to use to uh, get it working and to understand it is pretty complex. And that puts it out of reach of most developers today unless they're part of you know, a well-funded um, and, and sort of well-educated uh, business that's focusing on RL. So if we think about that for a moment, we actually find ourselves in a similar situation uh, with deep learning. And I'm just gonna wanna put this quote up here from a gentleman who uh, participated in our Deep Lens Hackathon. So my team also uh, built the AWS Deep Lens device, which we launched last year at reInvent. And this was a guy who literally, he won second place in our hackathon and he knew nothing about ML before he picked up a Deep Lens. In fact, I was at the pub crawl last night and I talked to a gentleman who had the exact same story. He was like, you know, I bought a deep lens. Uh, everything I know about machine learning, I learned from my deep lens. And you know, just the light bulb went off for us because developers have been telling us that they love this device and it's been super useful for them to learn about deep learning and machine learning. You know, they've deployed hundreds, uh, you know, tens of thousands of um, machine learning applications to their deep lens devices. We've seen uh, customers uh, uh, getting intuition for how machine learning can help solve problems in their business. And so we asked ourselves, like, can we help developers get rolling with reinforcement learning, literally? After much brainstorming, we decided against building a scale model data center and using RL to manage the cooling, though, to be honest, that would have been pretty cool. Uh, and instead, we landed on the AWS Deep Racer device, a fully autonomous 118th scale race car driven by reinforcement learning. It's got a camera in the front to see the track, an Intel-based compute platform to perform the model inference, and it's built on top of a four-by-four four monster truck RC car chassis. 
And I do have a device here that as we get under the hood a little bit later in the presentation, I'll kind of show you. That way you can get a sense for the size. Uh, and if you notice, you might be a little tricked by which end is forward. The tall, uh, solid end actually has the camera mounted in it, and that's the direction that the car drives uh, when it's driving autonomously. So Deep Racer actually has three components, the first being the car, the second being the console. Uh, in order to enable an end-to-end -end RL learning experience, we had to find a way to educate developers and um, guide them on kind of a fun journey of learning about RL, learning about reinforcement learning functions, um, and about the different pieces and the frameworks that come together to form an RL solution. So the Deep Racer console uh, is a cloud-based console that uh, you can access from the AWS Management Console that's integrated with and leverages Amazon SageMaker and AWS RoboMaker to actually uh, build, train, optimize, and then evaluate uh, reinforcement learning models. These reinforcement learning models are used to drive a virtual car around a virtual track. And you kind of see a couple screenshots there of the AWS RoboMaker simulator, um, and you see that's the same track that we're using here at reInvent. Um, and so as we built this thing and started like driving cars around on it, uh, you know, we realized what's a car without a little competition? And so today we also announced the AWS Deep Racer League, the world's first global autonomous racing league for developers. So. Uh, here, developers can train RL models for the fastest lap time in the cloud. Uh, in 2019, when we kick this off, we're going to have monthly stages for customers around the world to participate in online. But we're also going to co-host physical races at 20 AWS summits around the globe over the course of 2019. The winners of each of these stages get to progress to the League Cup at reInvent next year. Uh, in order to win the Champions Cup. So we actually kicked off the league for 2018 for about 20 hours today down at the MGM Garden Arena where we have a number of tracks set up and customers uh, either who go through one of our workshops or not. So you're very welcome as well to go down to the Grand Garden Arena and get hands-on with one of our, the fleet of cars we've got there. We've got a few sort of pre-trained sample models, or if you wanna go learn how to access the console and, and build and train your own model, you can do that as well. Uh, the top three lap times by 10.30 tonight will be racing uh, in a time trial tomorrow morning at Werner Vogel's uh, keynote. And the winner of that will be crowned the 2018 uh, Deep Racer League champion, and they'll get to hoist uh, the big Champions Cup. And we do have a giant Champions Cup that uh, we'll get to engrave the winner's names on. All right, so let's just go uh, one level deeper into RL. As I mentioned, RL is about using rewards to incentivize behavior. And so realistically, we, we see this happen uh, you know, on a daily basis. You know, think about the method to use a pet, used to train a pet. Uh, treats are used to incentivize desired behavior. You know, training can be around simple actions like just sit or stay. Um, or it can extend to more complicated behaviors like you sometimes see in those dog agility courses where your pets are crawling through tunnels and jumping over hurdles and weaving through poles. Reinforcement learning, uh, as I mentioned, is this branch of machine learning that's interested in the creation of a model that can be used by an agent to choose which actions to take in a specific environment in order to achieve a goal. So in the AWS Deep Racer case, we can think about each of these things and how they apply. So we're trying to build and train a model online. Our agent is the virtual car running in the simulator. The actions that it can take is the throttle or the left-right steering. The environment is essentially where it is on the track, and the goal is to complete the track in the lowest amount of time. So how does learning happen? So as Deep Racer drives around the track, uh, you know, it's taking basically pictures of the track in front of it, so that camera is running at about 10 to 15 FPS. 
uh, and the simulated uh, uh, racetrack, in, even in the virtual simulator, we're simulating the car looking at the front of the track in the same manner that the physical car would so that we get a good, what's called domain transfer. So the pictures that the car takes, you know, at, you know, that 10 FPS or whatever is effectively representations of the state of the environment. And the agent uses the state and the model to determine which action to choose, right? So maybe 10 times a second, uh, the model is kind of evaluating the environment and whether it should, you know, turn slight right, turn full right, go straight, turn slight left or full left, etc. So initially, the untrained model is gonna choose actions at random to explore the environment. But over time, it will notice which actions lead to better outcomes, which are of course dependent upon the state. It then starts exploiting this knowledge to repeatedly take the action that will lead to the best outcome based on that particular state. Now, you determine how soon your model sort of balances between exploiting the knowledge that it's gained and just exploring. Uh, if you exploit too soon, you might uh, forego finding a better action, like a more optimal path to your solution. Uh, but, er but if you explore too long, uh, your model might take a very long time to train because it might, it might never start to or it'll, it'll take a long time before it starts to exploit the knowledge that it already has. But how does your model know the best outcome? Whoops. How does your model know the best outcome for an action? The model will choose the action it thinks will lead to the outcome with the highest reward. And this is where that reward function comes in that we talked about. So for instance, a reward function for the AWS uh, Deep Racer could provide rewards for staying close to the center line um, and maybe decrease rewards exponentially as you move away from the center line during each state evaluation. Or it could give a reward for um, smooth steering. So maybe if, you, you know, if you're turning a lot and weaving, that's gonna slow you down. So maybe you're gonna sort of balance a reward function uh, to provide rewards based on maybe a combination of factors, like smooth steering and staying close to the center line. So when you look at Deep Racer, we'll give you a couple template reward files. And these are really simple. They're just Python uh, code, probably like 15 to 20 lines of code. Super simple for developers of almost any skill level to kind of take a look at and read. And then start tweaking those reward functions. So after each action, the simulator will use the reward function to quantify how good or bad an outcome is and calculate the reward for the outcome. So one such state where it, where it evaluates the reward for a specific um, action is called a step. And then there's a set of steps that happen uh, from the start state where we spawn the car in the virtual simulator to the point where it's a terminal state. In other words, if the car goes too far off the track or finishes a lap. We call that series of steps an episode. And so after a set number of episodes, uh, the model will use the experience obtained to uh, kind of restart the process and start to exploit the knowledge that it's already gained. Um, you know, models could have uh, a large number of episodes uh, in order to be successful for driving around the track, at least as we've seen with Deep Racer. Uh, anywhere from several hundred to a thousand or more episodes. And the beauty of it is, this is all happening online in a simulator. So uh, it's not like you have to wait for a car, walk around and pick up a car and put it back on the track. All of this happens online virtually. So once your model is trained, you'll basically have this function, which we, th we call a value function, uh, that knows what the cumulative reward is for all actions in a state. Simply selecting the uh, action with the highest reward will, should give the best outcome. And this mapping from state to an action is called the policy function. So this works when you can quantify every possible kind of state action reward set, um, but you know, just build like a lookup table. But for many RL domains, autonomous driving included, you can't explore every state action combination. And so what do you do? Like how, how do you know the reward value that's associated with each action? That's where you use a function or you approximate the value function. So I'm not gonna go into approximating the value function, but that's where um, neural networks and uh, deep reinforcement learning kind of come into play. And that's actually what's used on Deep Racer. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely encourage you to, um, you know, make some time on your own and explore um, 
uh, value functions and, and approximations for value functions and how they relate to um, you know, policy networks. Okay, so let's just take a quick look under the hood of the deep racer. Um, I do have a device here that I will go ahead and get out and then kind of use as my prop as I talk through the deep racer. So this device I've actually already pimped out with some stickers, so um, it's not the same uh, device that uh, you'll see over in the MGM arena, but they do have stickers over there, so um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to um, you know, have fun with the device. So you can see it's a little bigger than a shoebox. You know, it's again, it's the built on this 1 18th scale monster truck chassis, uh, and it's got a compute module in there. So let me just advance to the slide where we kind of go through the, under, the insides here and I'll show you more. Of course, as I mentioned, there's three key elements. There's the robotic car, there's the console, uh, and there's the race league. So let's take a look at each one. Uh, okay, we'll start with the console and then we'll get to the car because uh, if logically you think about your flow with AWS DeepRacer, you're always gonna start in the console because that's where you're gonna train the model. And then once the model is trained and you've evaluated it and you've established a lap time, then you're gonna deploy the model to the device. So this is just a simple uh, kind of pattern so you can see. It's really a, a, a kind of a cyclical uh, a series of steps that you go through here. You define your reward function. Uh, that feeds into sort of the model creation step. You configure the training, so that's those parameters that try to balance the e explore versus exploit. Those parameters are all packaged up and passed into uh, AW Amazon SageMaker and AWS RoboMaker. And those two services then uh, kind of talk to each other, as we'll see on the next slide, to perform the training over uh, a large number of episodes. Remember, we have steps that correspond to an episode. Once uh, you, you feel like your model has trained enough, and we'll actually show you a reward graph on the console, so you'll be able to see how high the reward function is able to get through each episode. Um, and you can see from that, uh, you get a rough idea of whether your device is able to um, you know, finish a lap. We also, during that simulation, we capture the video and we make it available via Kinesis video streams. And we pipe that video into the console. So while you're training, you can actually see your car driving in first person view on the virtual track. And so you'll get a very good idea of how long it's exploring versus how long it's, versus when it starts to exploit knowledge. Because it's very obvious when it's exploring, because it'll just drive right off the track, or it'll kind of go straight and then drive off the track. Um, and so that's a really fun part of the training process. So once your model is trained, you can evaluate it. So you can take your trained model, uh, and part of our process allows you to kick off an execution step. And that doesn't involve Amazon SageMaker, but it does involve AWS RoboMaker and the track, the virtual track. So we basically say at that point, okay, let's take this model, allow it to drive and control the virtual car, and just see if it can do one lap. And you can actually control it one, two, or three laps. Um, and it'll give you a, kind of a score for how well it does or if it's able to complete a track. If it's able to complete a lap, you can then take the lap time and you can submit it online to our leaderboard, which is what we'll use for the Deep Racer League. So once the league starts up, you'll be able to train and evaluate your models and then submit models to the leaderboard when you wanna kind of enter uh, the, 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 the league. All right, now let's take a look at the simulation architecture. It's a bit of an eye chart, I apologize. Um, so on the left-hand side is you on the console. When you kick off a training job, uh, a VPC is established and instances of Amazon SageMaker and AWS RoboMaker are spun up. Uh, they're fed the configuration parameters based on your reward function. So remember that Python code that maybe you edited or used one of our samples. Um, and the hyperparameters are fed into SageMaker to determine all of the training characteristics. RoboMaker will spin up an instance and use uh, the track that you've selected. Um, and the data that's generated during the training uh, gets piped out and stored. So as I mentioned, Amazon Kinesis video streams will show you the first person view of the virtual car during the simulation. We use Amazon CloudWatch to show those metrics. Like remember I said, we, you'll get a reward graph that shows you the reward score over time. And then Amazon S3, we store um, model artifacts into S3 so that you can then later download them to your car. And if you want to 
further uh, kind of lift up the covers or you know, open the hood and, and see what's going on, you can absolutely log into these services through your own AWS account. So the AWS DeepRacer console kind of abstracts this stuff out. So if you don't want to know about like how do I use AWS RoboMaker or I don't really care about notebooks in Amazon SageMaker, no worries, you can just use our console. But if you're interested in seeing how those things work and how the pieces fit together, you can just log into those services uh, because all of these things are created in your account. Um, and you can look at the AWS RoboMaker simulation, which uses Gazebo to do the simulation. Or you can go look at the notebook uh, that uh, Amazon SageMaker is using, and you can see how those parameters are fed in. We use Intel Coach uh, as our uh, reinforcement learning framework, so you can see how we use Coach um, to kind of distribute the workload or um, you know, manage, the, manage the training. So that's what's really cool about Amazon. We built this technology and this product on the same kind of building blocks that you guys all use and have, have access to. Um, so it really gives you a leg up in kind of seeing how things are put together and how RL actually works. All right, so now let's uh, go under the hood. So just a quick note on the specs. Um, as I mentioned, we've got this 118th scale car. Uh, we've got a compute module in there. So let me go ahead and take the cover off the device and then I'll try to show you. Of course, the parts aren't violet and, and light blue and green, um, but I can give you a sense of what's in here. So for the uh, astute observer, you'll notice that the camera is basically the exact same assembly that we use on deep lens. Uh, it worked for us there. We decided, hey, why should we change it? Um, and it's connected to the car very simply via USB. Oh, if I can get it out of here. Okay, well, uh, we've got multiple USB ports on the front here. Um, we basically designed this to be extendable, you know, down the road. Initially, we're just supporting a single camera in the center position on the front of the car. Uh, we put these extra USB ports. Potentially, we could do two cameras and do a stereo depth sensing, or um, you know, replace this camera with a USB mounted, um, you know, built-in uh, depth sensing camera. And that would, that, would make, that would change a lot of the reinforcement learning behavior, um, but it might enable uh, some more interesting behaviors down the road. So the car has two batteries. On top here is the compute battery um, and the vehicle battery. You can kind of see a little blue thing underneath here. That's the vehicle battery. Uh, the compute battery uh, is USB-C. It's pretty hefty. It'll, it'll power the compute for a good four or five hours. However, the car battery, this is a LiPo battery, and it'll drive the car for you know, 15 to 25 minutes based on sort of how fast and sort of how, how frequently you're sort of starting and stopping or your autonomous driving is doing that. It's got, uh, again, as I mentioned, an Intel Atom processor, four gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of eMMC, which is expandable. We do have a micro SD card slot over here, so if you want to do some interesting hacking, you can throw in a, slot, uh, a micro SD card and, and pull, some, pull some data off of it. Um, the camera, as I mentioned, is the same assembly as the deep lens camera, which is a four megapixel uh, MJPEG camera. Uh, the device, uh, just like deep lens, is also running Ubuntu 16.04.3 LTS. Uh, we actually use ROS Kinetic on the device. So ROS Kinetic is part of the AWS RoboMaker um, uh, solution. Uh, ROS stands for Robot Operating System. It's not actually an operating system. It's basically the set of libraries and code that allow us to um, do more robotic kind of activities on this, like controlling the ESC, which controls the throttle, or the servos for the steering. It also allows us to kind of streamline um, the uh, you know, sort of bus and the assembly between you know, the input uh, and the output and sort of the um, things that are doing the model inferencing on the device. We use Intel's OpenVINO toolkit to perform model optimization as well as perform the inferencing on the device and accelerate that inferencing uh, directly on the Intel uh, main logic board or the Intel CPU, I'm sorry. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we sort of designed this with extensibility in mind. So we've got three USB ports on the front. We've got um, a USB port kind of on the back here in a little bit of a weird position. Um, we designed it so that you, know, you could slide a USB uh, stick or maybe a USB um, kind of neural network accelerator in there and it would kind of stay out of the way as you were driving. Uh, there's an HDMI, a full-size HDMI port over here. So if you own a deep lens, uh, you're welcome. Uh, deep lens used a 
mini HDMI port. <laughs> and so it required you to go out and buy a different cord if you wanted to plug it into a monitor and, and get access to the Ubuntu desktop on here. So you can simply plug in your HDMI cable, throw a mouse and a keyboard into these USB ports or use Bluetooth, um, and you can code on this thing as if it were a Linux desktop. You know, you can, you can get at the, at the code directly, which is a very similar model to what we did with DeepLens. Uh, then we've got a, um, a mini USB port or a micro USB port here. And the idea here is that you could connect this to your computer. And once you connect it to your computer, uh, this device will look like a, a hard drive. So we'll use some USB on the go type technology. And that's how you deploy models. So you download models from the cloud to your desktop device, and then you just drag and drop them over onto the car's drive. Um, and they're sort of slurped up by the software on the car uh, and loaded uh, onto the file system. And then uh, there's a USB-C port here, but it's just for power delivery. Uh, and that's what this uh, big power, uh, power brick is. It's a USB-C power brick. So that's the, that's the extent of the uh, device itself. I think I do have another slide on uh, some of the uh, system software on the device. Again, another, uh, another eye chart for you here. But the basics, uh, the, the kind of top line kind of shows you that when you download the model from uh, the cloud and you drop it onto the device, it will get processed by Intel's OpenVINO toolkit and optimized for uh, the Atom processor. During the execution of the autonomous driving, um, you've got a video feed from the camera that goes through a media engine, um, and it gets output as a MJPEG stream. The MJPEG stream uh, is split, uh, and part of it is copied to this web server video, and part of it goes through the OpenVINO inference. So web server video, what's that? So the device, uh, when it's powered on and running, uh, serves up its own web page, and that's how you manage the device. So um, you know, if you load a model on there and you power it on, the device isn't going to autonomously start driving and just shoot off. You actually have to go load the device management web page. Uh, you have to say, OK, I'm in autonomous mode. Which model do I want to start executing? And then you've got start and stop buttons. So you could load, potentially, if you've built and trained you know, three or four or 10 different models in the cloud, maybe with different reward functions, you could potentially load all of those onto your car and then just use the drop down in the web interface to select a different model to execute and see how it works in the real world. So OpenVINO um, helps us perform that model inferencing. The inferencing, go into, go, the inferencing results go into a navigation node, uh, at which point we kind of uh, then use our control node to figure out uh, the signals that we want to send to the throttle or the steering. You see right underneath there, there's another set of boxes that say web server publisher and manual drive. So we did enable a manual drive capability on the device. So when you pull up that device management web page, there's a toggle for manual uh, or autonomous driving. You can flip it into manual mode. You'll see in the web page, like on your phone, tablet, or computer, you'll see the first person view from the camera. And you'll see like a little touch joypad that you can actually use to drive the car around. So it kind of operates like a, like a bit of a toy RC car in that case. Um, but you know, that's just for kind of testing things out and making sure that all the connectivity works. Um, and so again, as we mentioned, that's built on top of ROS Kinetic. So these things are all ROS nodes. Um, initially, uh, we, won't, we don't have the source code published to these ROS nodes. They're you know, binaries. Some of them are written in C++. But I think over time, uh, we'll figure out how we can kind of um, you know, bring developers into the loop and, and show them more detail about the robotics code that's actually running on the device. Um, and then make it easier for you as developers to potentially plug in different ROS nodes. Because ROS has been around for a while. There's lots of um, kind of ROS examples online that you can get to perform different types of actions. And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in with AWS DeepRacer is seeing where developers take it. And so that's why we've done some of this extra work for extensibility of the hardware and uh, choosing to use ROS on the device. All right, let's keep going. Here's uh, just a couple slides, and then we'll open for questions about uh, how the rubber meets the road. Um, so as you may have heard, uh, you can get involved at the MGM Speedway, which is 
uh, at the Garden Arena. It's a little bit of a hike from here, but it's not too bad. You kind of go out of the conference center um, and walk around and down, and you'll find yourself in the Garden Arena. It's actually open till midnight tonight, so even after this session, if you're interested in kind of getting hands-on with a device, um, seeing how a model might uh, run on the device, I encourage you to head over there. Um, I was over there around 6, 6.30. The line wasn't too bad. It was like 15 or 20 minutes, and you could get onto the floor of the arena and get in line at one of our six tracks um, to actually get your hands on with a device. Um, you'll win cool prizes, and we're giving away swag, so everybody that gets over there and runs a device, uh, you know, you'll get a hat and a pin, and then every hour we're giving away uh, deep lens devices for people who are on the leaderboard. So it's a lot of fun. If you don't get over there today, it'll also be open tomorrow from 11.30 to 5.30. Uh, and what we see is that when the workshops get out, you know, the workshop attendees sort of all go over there. So if you can kind of look at when workshops are happening and time your arrival over there, you can probably get there at a lull and you'll have a better chance of uh, getting on the track. We also have a dedicated space off of the floor of the MGM Garden Arena that we call the Hacker Garage. So if you do want to, you know, consult with an expert, um, you know, uh, ask to get access to the console for the next couple days. Uh, we can help assist you with that, and you can get some hands-on with the simulator and the console and take a look at how it works in the hacker garage. So we've got some experts, some of the members of our engineering team, uh, a number of expert SAs and others uh, who are great resources who can help you um, up in the hacker garage. Finally, uh, I want to just uh, mention again the Deep Racer League, uh, this global autonomous racing league for developers. Um, it's launching actually, so we say here launching in 2019 online and at select AWS Summit locations, but we're actually executing the 2018 version of the league today. Um, and you actually won't have too much time to participate in the 2018 version because what we're doing is we're collecting the fastest lap times from uh, customers who are over at the MGM tracks between when the announcement happened at 11, 11.30 this morning and 10.30 tonight. So if you do go over there immediately after this, you've got a chance to get on the leaderboard for the final. So we're gonna pick the top three lap times and those top three lap times are going to race their cars with their model at uh, the intro to Werner Vogel's keynote tomorrow morning at eight. Um, so that's an opportunity to get involved uh, as well if you feel like you've got some skills or you want to just sort of see how you do against some of the others. So those are two uh, great ways that you can kind of get involved. Um, I just want to say thank you. Here's my email. And, um, you know, I'm happy to chat uh, afterwards. But let's open the floor to questions. We're about, uh, you know, 40 minutes in, just under 40 minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. There's two microphones up here if anybody has questions. Or if you want to get right over to the Hacker Garage or the MGM Speedway, feel free to, to head over there. But I am available for questions. Question over here. Yes, sir. It's kind of a stupid question. Anyway, uh, how fast does it go, and uh, uh, will the simulator consider that the, the car may be uh, uh, crash? Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, how fast does it go? Am I concerned the car will crash? Uh, for those who are leaving, try to complete the session survey in the mobile app. Um, I think maybe there's a pin opportunity to earn pins for the session surveys that you guys create. Just use the mobile app. Uh, okay, so back to the question. It was how fast does, it, does the device go and um, you know, is, it, is it prone to crashing? So the device at top speed will hit like probably 15 miles an hour uh, or more. Um, and in that interface where you toggle between manual and aut autonomous driving mode, we actually have a throttle limiter that you can specify. So you can say, hey, look, even in manual mode or in autonomous driving mode, I only want to allow this car to drive at 60% throttle. And that gives you a lot of control over whether the car sort of shoots off away and crashes into a wall. Uh, so that's, we've added that as kind of a little safety feature. And there's also a start and stop button in that web interface. So uh, if it does get away from you, you just hit the stop button and you should be good. And next question. Are you going to sell full-size tracks? Are we going to sell full-size tracks? Oh, you know, and I, I didn't mention. So the pre-order for the device uh, started this morning. Uh, $299, uh, sorry. Retail price is $399 for the device. Uh, we've got a special offer during the pre-order uh, of $249. 
Um, and that's actually, I think it's a limited time or limited number of, item, uh, of units at 249. Um, what we've uh, said about tracks is that we'll provide instructions and templates. So if you want to like print or build your own type of tracks, you can. Um, I think we've had a number of questions about selling, you know, versions of the carpeted tracks that we've got over in the arena. Uh, and so I think that's a great idea and it's definitely one we'll look at. Yeah. Thanks. Over here. Um, what is your personal best time on the track? What's my personal best time? You know, I've been doing press interviews and working on the keynote today, so I haven't raced a car over there. Uh, but certainly when we were doing the virtual simulator uh, at, at work, um, you know, I could finish a lap about maybe 75% of the time. Um, and I think my best time was like 113, one I think, 112 or 113. At the track, they're hitting like 30, 30 seconds and below. I mean, they're really cruising around the tracks over there now. So, uh, yeah. I think 14. 14 is the leader. Wow, that's just nuts. That's crazy. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, the physics has to uh, uh, factor into this. Uh, so, say if you would uh, modify the ba car battery of uh, the car to make it go faster, uh, what would you have to change in the simulation to, to train uh, the car on, on the... Yeah, very, very observant. The, the, the simulation environment, you want it to match the car as closely as possible, especially in the physics, whether that's you know, the friction of the tires on the particular surface, you know, we've got some tweaks there. Um, uh, definitely, if you're gonna go and modify the hardware or sort of change the car, like increase the battery or change the tires, uh, in order to get a good, so they call that sim to real transfer, um, in order to get a better sim to real transfer, uh, you'll wanna make the simulator match as close as you can the physics of the actual device. Um, and so that's kind of a science and an art uh, in itself. But luckily, you'll have access to AWS RoboMaker um, and the simulated tracks that we provide. Um, and you'll be able to kind of embark on some of those things on your own. Yeah, but is there um, some uh, best practices on how to get the simulation and the reality to match? Gotcha. Are there best practices? Um, you know, I think that's a great question. That's one we'll have to kind of address uh, after we launch. Um, and as we get some users using it and exploring the simulator, um, we'll, we'll figure out what's the best way to make sure we teach, teach developers or get them uh, started on the right foot if they're gonna go and modify that kind of thing. Yeah, good question. I, I was at the 200, uh, sorry, at the Hacker Garage earlier, yeah. and someone said one of the 200 level courses had tips about the um, variables that are passed in and some ideas about what to do. I was kind of expecting 300 would have more than he said 200 had is. Gotcha, oh I apologize. Did he just happen to have a 200 course that someone went deeper than gotcha. the agenda or? Gotcha, I apologize. So uh, the workshops that we've been running all day are definitely the place where you're gonna get hands on and they're gonna uh, show you the reward function and they're gonna talk about the variables in the reward functions. Um, I think also the Hacker Garage would have been a great place. I'm surprised they didn't give you some extra insight into that uh, reward function there. Um, I think the reward functions that we've seen perform well uh, are a combination of limiting the sort of, uh, like sort of erratic steering, trying to smooth the steering, uh, combined with kind of uh, a variety of sort of center line following kind of behaviors. Um, uh, you know, and I think people have started to experiment with a lot of different ways. I mean, we haven't uh, gone sort of down the, down the path of having months or years of work to kind of try these things out. And so I think that's part of the fun here is developers will get to kind of experiment and see what works well. So I apologize. Uh, earlier and just now. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the state of what the steering was previously passed to us. Uh, so the, so that's, that's a good question. So the reward <laughs> function is based on sort of the current state with sort of where the steering is at. So how, yeah, how we'll, let me get back to you on that. I'll talk, I'll okay. talk to our experts and sort of figure that out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see a SageMaker RL on the iChart. Is it involved in, in the process too? Uh, it, it is, so, so Amazon SageMaker was there. Um, SageMaker RL is uh, the, enhanced, the, the enhancements to SageMaker that include support for common frameworks. So actually we use Intel Coach uh, under the covers um, of, the, uh, of, the, 
of the instances that we set up and the communication between the instances and the training of the RL model. And uh, SageMaker RL uh, allows you to support Intel Coach and Ray RL as frameworks as well. Okay. So in effect, that's probably a good call out. We probably could have said that was Amazon SageMaker RL that we were using. Okay, and then uh, when I was down there, they, um, they said that the calibration on Reboot can take up to 20 minutes. What, is that an automated process, or what, what, what does that entail? Oh, that's interesting. Calibration on Reboot, they said. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, there's a calibration step that you can take where you um, kind of reset uh, the car's understanding of, like, the neutral ser uh, servo position for the steering as well as the throttle calibration. Um, but that's a relatively quick quick process that you do with the mobile app, it wouldn't take you more than four or five minutes. Okay. I'm not sure where the 20 minute came right. from. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, besides from racing, can we also use the car uh, to experiment other kind of purposes, like following an object, following something, this kind of things? Yeah, I think, I think we're interested in where developers want to take this. So that Intel OpenVINO toolkit that's on the device allows you to accelerate uh, not just our RL model inference, but you could put, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a different um, you know, object detector on there yeah. if you wanted to. And then you might have to do some work to sort of figure out how you combine execution of an RL model and maybe an object detector. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking before too long, we're gonna see somebody hack this car to follow like their cat around the house or you know, something, something silly like that. I can imagine uh, developers kind of doing really interesting stuff by combining behaviors. Yeah, I'm, also, I'm asking also to understand what's your, I mean, purpose at the long term with this car? I mean, it cannot be only racing, I guess. I think if you think back to our primary reason for building this, it's really about giving developers a fun and hands-on way to get access to this innovative new technology. And uh, it should be accessible for everyday developers and data scientists. And that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and you know, using the league was just a way to kind of provide a fun and more engaging kind of environment yeah. so that you don't use it once and go, OK, that's kind of cool, and then put it on a shelf. Uh, by participating in the league and sort of having new challenges uh, encourages everybody to kind of get involved and sort of um, you know, hone their skills. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. What are some of the potential costs associated with this? You mentioned that there was a, like a, a client per se to like automatically train it or whatever, but you also mentioned SageMaker. Is there yep. the opportunity to start shifting over towards more of like the advanced SageMaker capabilities integrated into the car, similar to what you were talking about with developers kind of going to the next level and having it follow a cat, for example? Yeah. Um, what would you, and I know very little about the machine learning model system, what would you say the annual cost of like just maintaining that would be if a developer were to take this up? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we are, when uh, the device uh, starts shipping and the console is available for general availability, uh, there will be a free tier associated with the usage of the device uh, or of the console. So usage of the device, obviously, once you buy it, it's free. You don't have to pay for driving your car around. Uh, but you do have to pay for the um, you know, cloud processing during the training um, and um, you know, sort of evaluation of your models. Um, there will be a free tier that should get you, that'll, it's like a time limited free tier uh, up to a certain dollar amount. And then after that, you'll have to pay for the, um, uh, the SageMaker usage and the uh, AWS RoboMaker usage. Uh, and we'll have a pricing page published online. I think we actually do have a pricing page out there today, but it'll be updated as we get closer to launch with more accurate sort of um, numbers based on instance types and sort of the efficiencies that we can gain. And there are some things that we can do that we've started to optimize, but to be honest, we haven't gone down the, down the path. So for instance, in a simulator, you know, there's nothing that's requiring you to run the simulator at, uh, in real time. You know, you could potentially bump up the speed of your simulator, um, you know, by 2x even or more, um, and that would, you know, shorten the amount of time that you need to, um, you know, execute for training. You know, the usage, uh, you know, might go up, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a trade-off, and that's something we'll be looking at. And as this field evolves, obviously, you said that this could be potentially, um, you swap out a battery or tires or things like that. Is there, like, an accessory sort of, like, you know, like, what's the plans for that? Ultimately, like let's say you come out with a new Intel Atom processor. Sure. What's the plans for that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you, if you think about the way Amazon works and AWS works in general, we listen to our customers, right? And we're building things based on what they need. Um, and especially in a tool like this, we're gonna listen to developers who use this and start building on it, hacking on it, uh, to understand what are the best kind of accessories or other sort of um, you know, version two or other type of things that'll make it easier for them to learn. So we'll Do you get sell there. car insurance for this? I'm sorry? Are you gonna sell car insurance for this? Car nice? insurance, right. <laughs> All right, a couple more questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, in term or context of the league, yep. And in the in reference to modifying the cars, there, you must have some standards. That yeah, that's a good point. So, for the league uh, in 2019, you're only going to be able to run a stock car. At least that's kind of our current stance right now. Uh, that way, we have a more level playing field. Sure. Uh, but I think if you think in the full, you know, in the fullness of time, it would be really interesting to have like an open car league and a stock car league, right? Where we could see, hey, what could developers or teams do with the hardware to, you know, sort of improve it, right? And obviously, there'd be guidelines and like you can't just replace the whole thing, or maybe you have to use the same yeah. processor. Or, who knows? I think that's an exciting, Thanks. that's one of the exciting things about this, uh, about this concept is that we can go into really interesting places with it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned earlier about uh, adding a secondary input device via the USB port that's on the unit. Yep. Um, is that something that, I'm assuming that would go with the OpenVINO toolkit that's with it. Is, does it have something built in maybe for like secondary image processing or is it something that would have to be custom coded? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, uh, we, we could find out uh, if it's something that has to be like serialized and sort of swapped or if you know you can run sort of two models right. in parallel. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, we have to look into that. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Good question though. All right. Somebody just asked uh, what is application beyond racing. I was thinking about, I, I thought like uh, uh, robotic lawnmower where I got return it, it can work so well. And I also saw like, uh, you know, Boston is coming, iRobot, you know, they design like uh, robotic. Uh, Sorry, can you step close to the mic? It's a little hard to hear you. Yeah, so like robotic, uh, like a vacuum cleaner. Robotic so vacuum. I wonder like other manufacturers actually potentially interested in partnering with AWS to improve their actually performance for their robots using potentially this platform? I think this platform is an interesting platform as an example of what you can use RL for. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are other manufacturers who come talk to us about kind of the concepts that we're showing here or even use this to kind of prototype or think about other applications. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have anything that I can talk about right now, but I think that's pretty interesting. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, oh, one more. Training in spot, is that, um, are there scripts to kick it off? Obviously it's not in the portal yet. I'm sorry, training what? Training in spot instances. Training in spot instances. Oh, that's a good question. We, ha we haven't even really explored that, um, but that's uh, an interesting idea. Uh, we'll, right. we'll definitely try to tee that up. Yeah, it seems like it'll be easy. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Probably. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Remember to uh, complete the session survey in the mobile app and uh, really appreciate your time. Have a great uh, rest of your reInvent. And head down to the MGM Speedway if you want to get uh, a chance on the devices. <laughs>